This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. What the hell is the NHL doing? Like, what the hell is the NHL doing? Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Real Talk. <clears throat> We're going to be talking to Professor Ben Perrin uh, in just a moment. He's got a new book out, Indictment. He's putting Canada's criminal justice system on trial. We're going to find out how we can figure out how we can fix Canada's broken criminal justice system. And later in the show, we're going to be talking about a few other things as well. This show called it. It was confirmed by CBC yesterday. Ontario's Premier Doug Ford, that whole Greenbelt deal being investigated by police. There could be charges. There could be handcuffs. There could be, in theory, jail time. There could be a change in leadership when it comes to Ontario's political leaders, including the premier. That's a story we'll continue to follow. But today, we can't help but pay attention to a move made by the National Hockey League announced by OutSports that not only is the NHL outlawing, banning warm-up jerseys, celebrating different causes. You know this. This is old news. We talked about it on the show before. The NHL saying no to jerseys around pride, uh, military nights, breast cancer, indigenous causes. I mean, you name it. No more because a few hockey players were getting uncomfortable having their name bars and their numbers in rainbow colors through warm-ups. And while well, they made a big stink about it, and so the league stepped up to save those guys from being uncomfortable. But now the NHL says that it's banning pride tape. It's unwrapping the tape off the blades of players who might want to wear that tape, developed right here in Edmonton, by the way, mm -hmm. in warm-ups. The NHL is actually going proactively regressive. The NHL is taking a huge step back. Remember that whole hockey is for everyone thing? Well, it turns out that's not the case. The latest decision by NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman. We lead off with that in just a second. But first, we've all heard by now that credential fraud is on the rise. Uh, whether it's nurses, oil patch workers, or personal support workers, there's been no shortage of news headlines when fake credentials are putting people's safety at risk. Luckily, there's an innovative technology that'll make credential fraud a thing of the past. Digital, verifiable credentials are secure. Cloud-based credentials that go far beyond a traditional certificate, digital badge, or PDF. They are impossible to forge, falsify, or alter. Verifiable credentials are tamper-proof and independently verifiable. They use open web standards. They're trusted, real-time digital credentials that live in a digital wallet, so they can be viewed, managed, shared from anywhere. And with We Know training, they can plug seamlessly into your training courses. If you want to learn more about using verifiable credentials in your training or credentialing program, just visit verifiablecredentials.ca. So the NHL makes the announcement that Pride Tape is out. There will be no representation of anybody except for straight hockey players. <laughs> As warm-ups happen, of course, the league dropping, dropping the puck uh, just last night, just <laughs> yesterday, if you're listening to this on October 11th, the yeah. first few games, Connor Bedard's Chicago Blackhawks beating Sidney Crosby's Pittsburgh Penguins in his yeah. very first National Hockey League game. But I didn't game. see any hat tricks. I just saw a single point. So, <laughs> so well, this guy's not that good. So disappointed. But Connor Bedard's NHL career yeah. will not include, even for a single game, any mm -hmm. player repping pride tape in warm-ups. And, of course, there's been uh, – I, I don't know if I want to say outcry and outrage. I think a lot of people are hurt. I think a lot of people are disappointed. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are asking, what the hell is the league thinking with this one? Oh, it's it's funny. You know, pride tape is out, but if, if you're a gay person, you can't be. I mean, it's the only – professional North American sports league where no one former or current has come out as gay. And why do you think that is? We have the one guy from Edmonton, uh, Kyle uh, Prokhorov. What's the, I forget his last name anyways, but he's, he's on a scouting contract, right? He's not actually playing in the league, but that that's why. I mean, because this is the only league where... You're talking Luke Prokop, by Luke the way. Luke Prokop, yeah. From Edmonton, right? Former Royal King. Yeah, former Royal King, National Predators yeah. prospect. Um, but, I mean, that it, that seems strange to me. I mean, all other sports, you've got all sorts of people from all different walks of life who who have come forward. And it just seems like people aren't comfortable in the NHL to do it just yet. And you've got 
all these people. Uh, let me cue up some of the. Well, video. Hang on a second. Let me get to these in a second. So you've you've got basically a situation here where the best players in the National Hockey League are all and against. Keep in them. mind, <laughs> hockey culture is boring. Uh, hockey players traditionally do not <laughs> speak truth to power. No. They're not outrageous. No. They don't show a lot of personality. Hockey fans don't even love seeing personality unless it's a player on their team. Right? Mm -hmm. you remember when Alex Ovechkin first came in the league and celebrated his goals big time, and Don Cherry was talking about how he's going to have his head taken off. Oh, my gosh. They you know, didn't like his visor they or don't his like shoelaces. Visor. They don't like or, certain personality. Yeah. They don't like people who step out, but... It's happening with the league's biggest star, the best mm -hmm. hockey player in the world, Connor McDavid. Now, he didn't exactly pull out a flamethrower and roast the National Hockey League's commissioner. But as far as Connor McDavid's comments go, this as one's good as it gets. pretty pointed. In Edmonton, whether that's, you know, Pride Night or Military Night or um, Indigenous Night, like, you know, all the various uh, nights that we've had and had a chance to celebrate um, you know, I've always enjoyed them. Um, I can't speak for everybody else or the league or anything like that, but it's something that I've, I've, I've always enjoyed and um, something I've come on before. Do you feel like the league's maybe kind of taking a step backwards here and, and as a leading player and a, you know, influential guy, yep. is there a place among the players to push back on this at all? Well, um, I mean, like I said, I've, 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 uh, expressed uh you know disappointment in not being able to wear you know the various jerseys or the tapes or whatever um you know whether that's pride tape or pink tape or or, or anything um you know i bought some like i said it's always something that i've enjoyed in terms of a league standpoint um you know um is it something that uh that i'd like to see put back into place one day uh certainly um you know but that's not the way it is right now now, Connor McDavid, the most powerful man in hockey, uh, whether Gary Bettman likes it or not. Uh, Connor McDavid has more influence in hockey. Uh, Gary Bettman may have more influence on hockey right now, but that doesn't last forever. Uh, in our live chat, it's split today. Kathy says, I don't understand why the NHL won't let teams. So why don't you just leave it up to the teams to decide what they want to support me? Wants its fans back. That's ridiculous. The <laughs> NHL's never been more popular. Jesus. Vegas just won a Stanley Cup. I don't think you watch hockey. Smurphy says hockey's for everyone except. All right. Uh, Ben's got his popcorn out. Kham says, aren't there more pressing issues to discuss besides LGBTQ hockey tape? This is a time for conversations that will and change our world as we know it. Jeez, says Kham. I mean, you could check out yesterday's episode if you want to hear about Israel and Palestine or domestic violence. You're going to hear about Canada's criminal justice system in five minutes. But right now, this is an issue because uh, there are people that desire to be represented as fans of the game. There are people that want to feel welcome in hockey arenas. And not only is this the league not doing something, this isn't just the National Hockey League not being proactive about something. It is walking something back. It's taking a step back. And that's why I think people like Calgary star Jonathan Huberto. Uh, Huberto speaking out yesterday to reporters once this story surfaced. Here he is. Guys to wear pride tape during an actual game, and, and yesterday was announced that the league isn't going to allow pride tape for practices or games. Sort of the I mean, I think it's it's not our our decision. So I mean, you know, I fully supported it. And still support it. I think you know it's the, the way they, they they went along. But for me personally, I support it. And you know, if I get the chance to do it, I'll, I'll do it. You won't go against the league's No, I probably won't. I don't want to get, get in trouble. <laughs> but uh, you know, like I said, I fully support it. It's just like the way they, they went with it. And I think you know you gotta respect that. Were there any guys who pushed back on that when you heard that it was happening? I mean, I mean, we all talk talk about about stuff like that, you know. But it's. At the end of the day, it's the league's decision, so we don't want to get in, in, into that, into a lot of details. We just respect that. That was Jonathan Huberto in Calgary. I mean, it's, it's the most you can say for these guys in their position. But for all these guys, you've Is got though? Zach Hot <laughs> I mean, like you said, they're, they're not like the most outspoken guys. But when you've got Huberdeau, when you've got Zach Hyman, when you've got Connor McDavid, when you've got Sidney Crosby, we, I could have pulled 30 clips today of all these people yeah. who are saying the same thing. Like, obviously, this is super disappointing. And like you said, this isn't like, hey, we're going to decide not to do this further thing. 
This is like we're going back, mm-hmm. like Pride three tape, steps. Pride tape, the, the the product, the initiative, the movement, the, the whatever you want to call it, uh, was awarded like advertising awards internationally recognized for what a step forward it was for the league to show it could be inclusive, to welcome new fans to the fold, to make people feel like they were part of hockey culture. In the meantime, Haywire in the live chat says, well, the NHL doesn't want to get Bud Lighted. It's a good move. Of course, everybody knows that story. Remember Bud Light? Which This story was so blown out of proportion. Mm-hmm. A, a, a trans woman, an influencer, had Bud Light send her a can, a custom can with her picture on it, her likeness mm-hmm. of it. It wasn't a big promo campaign, but even if it was, who gives a fuck? But they sent her the can. The can went public, went viral. People started calling for bans and boycotts on Bud Light. They we showed the video months. Yeah. Oh, they dipped big time. Like, they they lost about 11, 12% but I mean, market share. Yeah. But, they, but they were talking about, I mean, you had like Kid Rock with his, you know, AR-15, Johnny, out on his property <laughs> blowing up you know, cases like eviscerating cases of Bud Light. And but then, of course, photographed at a football game drinking Bud Light. Two I was just going to say it's it's over for him even, too. He's at a music festival drinking it. And like they went from what? Number one beer sales in the world to, to two. I get it. Yeah. it's But like, is that going to happen to the NHL? Never. N- people aren't going to turn off their TVs and not watch the sport at all. I Now, I do see people. I had a conversation uh, with a friend about this yesterday. In particular, it was it, he was relating it to the Israel Hamas war and, and the violence that's erupting in Israel and Gaza and the West Bank. Uh, And and he was saying, you know, I think a lot of people, when it comes to like moments of silence and leagues recognizing certain things and taking positions, he said a lot of people want to go to a hockey game or go to a concert to uh, get away from everything, to escape everything. I'm just not convinced. As a matter of fact, I am convinced that it's not true that somebody sitting in the stands watching their favorite team warm up Mm -hmm. with a few of the players rocking pride tape in the warm ups. You you can't legally actually, uh, according to league rules, you can't use colored tape during the game. Uh, Goalies always complain about that stuff. So it would only be in warm ups that the pride tape would be rocked. Is there somebody that feels like their in-game experience Mm -hmm. That's not a full-blown homophobe. Uh, <laughs> is there anybody that feels that their in-game experience has been compromised Altered. if the best player in the world is rocking pride tape on his stick? Not at all. And I think that that's the point. Like, it's not that, hey, we're not going to do this anymore. They've literally banned. You can't use the tape at all. And I'm, I, we've talked about this before. We kind of think the national anthem even is kind of something that they could get rid of. Like, I would be all for getting rid of all of these things, and I'm the same way. When I go to a hockey game... I want to have a few beers. I want to forget about all the crazy, horrible, sad, anxiety, depressing things going on in the world. But at the same time, wow. If somebody wants to use the tape and warm up, they're now banned. Yeah, I mean, Kimberly says the league's definitely taking a step backwards. Uh, Others are saying, you know, Sylvia says, Gary Bettman says it's a distraction. That's a lame excuse. Uh, an '80s fanify, I think. With it, this is early to award the comment of of the show, so I won't yet. But this one's in the running. '80s fanify wonders who's the player to take the lead and rock pride tape anyway. That's when it fir- when we first started using it in warm ups. I was like, this would be amazing because I knew they weren't allowed. But if someone just did, I'd someone like came out Connor for McDavid. one shift. What's the lead? You know, they do is does Gary Bettman want a war with Connor McDavid? He comes out with does he pride want to pick tape. A fight with him. He you wants to tell f- him he to wants take to it find off? the best player in the world. You're going to tell him to get rid of it? I don't think so. I really don't think so. You know, Goose says Bettman's idea of two more teams in the least popular of all major sports leagues is laughable. He's talking about expansion. Uh, it says <laughs> GTFOH. If you don't know what that means, you can just Google it. Justin says, I'd love to see McDavid of the Oilers decide to use that tape anyway and just pay the fines. I'd love to see that as well. I love guys pretty much people, uh, I mean, within reason, that uh, just swallow fines on purpose. Love it. They're going to do stuff anyway. And you see athletes do this a lot. In hockey, please, somebody do something exciting for once in the last 40 years. I lost the uh, I lost the comment here, so I can't give credit to whoever it was. But they said, oh, here it is. MZ coach says, I thought hockey players had balls. Um, I love that. We could get into the debate about how we have weird language around balls and pussy and how pussies are way more tough than balls. But we've already gone there on Real Talk before. <laughs> you ever seen a guy get kicked in the balls? He goes down. You ever yeah. seen, uh, if I could be crude for a second, pardon me, a pussy push out an eight pound baby? It's the toughest shit on planet Earth. We have our language all messed up, but I'll take your point. I thought hockey players had balls. I agree with you. And I'd like to see, like Sharon's saying, push back and use the tape. 
Uh, you can let us know what you think about this talk at ryanjesperson.com. Of course, that's where you can find us. You'll also get us on TikTok, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter. I saw our TikTok was pulled down yesterday talking about the yeah. war. TikTok very... Uh, Censor heavy, if hey? You use hashtags to do with... Uh, War, violence, terrorism, yeah. drugs, anything, even if it's not in the actual video. So it's very hard. People can still find it on Instagram. Uh, Instagram, and you can find it on our YouTube shorts as well. And we're going to play it for you coming up when we get to some of your emails. Our inbox absolutely flooded after yesterday's show, which is no surprise. Professor Ben Perrin coming up in 90 seconds. Right now, I wanted to tell you that the Kubi Renewable Energy Team is going to be at the Edmonton Fall Home Show. That's coming up October 13th through the 15th. This is a great chance for you to come check out their booth, learn about all things solar questions you may have. Well, you'll get them answered by the pros with decades. Decades of experience in the renewable energy industry. And if you're interested in installing solar in your home uh, or maybe your farm or your commercial property or what have you, heck, it could be out at your cottage that's off the grid. You want to bring power out to it. Their experts will give you an overview of the entire installation process from start to finish to make sure that you feel confident when you're making the switch. Our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park want to remind you that they've got the sauced and tossed honey garlic chicken strip basket ready for you. Four pieces or six. Go with the six. Do yourself a favor. This is chicken done differently. I mean, the DQ special saucing technique means mouth-watering goodness in every single bite. A deliciously satisfying way to appease your honey garlic craving. You can pick up a sauced and tossed honey garlic chicken strip basket today at a DQ in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. I was talking to my buddy Adam, who's a real talker last week. We were meeting about a project we're going to work mm -hmm. on together. And he goes, I live right by the Westmount DQ. And he says, and I blame you for the fact that I can't drive past it. I said, you make sure you let him know when you're <laughs> well, in the drive through the smell. You can't drive you past can't it. Drive you past smell past the it. flame broiled. Well, and I said to him, why would you? Why would you drive past it? If you're looking at renewing or reinvigorating, maybe totally reinventing your outdoor space in the spring, or in time for next summer, now is the perfect time to get in touch with Eden Landscaping, a custom builder with more than 20 years of on-the-ground experience in Edmonton and area. Whether you're looking for a big overhaul, maybe water features, an outdoor kitchen, or, or maybe it's something a little smaller. Maybe, maybe you want to run gas out into a thermostat, get your garage heated before winter. They can do that excavation. They've done it all. And they earn the return business and referrals of their clients. It all comes with working with a team that is built of great listeners. That's the story with Eden Landscaping. You can find them online at landscapeedmonton.ca. Uh, Professor Ben Perrin has been a, a great friend of this show since inception. Uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper is former justice advisor. He's a law professor at the University of British Columbia. He's the author of a brand new book, Indictment, the criminal justice system on trial. It's great to see your face, pal. How have you been? I'm great. How are you doing, Ryan? Yeah, not doing too bad. Uh, throwing you a hot one right out of the gates. What do you make of the NHL banning pride tape? How does that land with you? I just think that we need to treat everyone with with dignity and respect. And, you know, today there's so many issues that are dividing people in our communities and Canadians. And, um, yeah, it's it's really heartbreaking. And I just um, I just have found through all of my research, uh, the best thing we can do is listen. Listen to people who have experiences that are different than ours. That's uh, very well said. Uh, you've got your brand new book out. Congratulations. I, I know that, that a lot of work goes Thanks. into that. Uh, indictment, the criminal justice system on trial. You know, we talk a lot about our broken criminal justice system. And I've, I've got some more specific or pointed questions for you in just a little bit. But generally speaking, someone like you, a law professor with lots of experience, uh, how, how do you get to a point where you look at Canada's criminal justice system and say, we're in big trouble here? What are some of the signs? Well, you know, I don't think anyone is really satisfied with the way our criminal justice system is going. We have rising crime rates. We have um, massive rates of people dying from unregulated drug deaths. The latest stats in Alberta, there's been a 37 uh, percent increase right, in, in people dying from unregulated drugs. Uh, survivors of crime have given up on the system. Uh, only a third of criminal offenses even get reported to police. And we see an ever growing proportion of Indigenous and Black people being incarcerated, caged in our our jails and prisons throughout Canada. So um, the system, in fact, I, I don't say it's broken. I think it's perfectly designed to get the results that it's getting. And that's why it keeps getting them. And we need to look completely differently at how we address harm in our society.
so it sort of feels like, and <clears throat> I'm oversimplifying this, obviously, uh, but it seems to me like there's a couple different schools of thought on this. And, and, and one of them seems to be, I mean, gosh, I don't want to contribute to this narrative, but I'm going to. Uh, one of them is kind of the left leaning one, which is like rehabilitation and, 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 and providing people resor- uh, you know, resources and, and having faith in humanity that people can change and, and people deserve a second chance. And then the kind of right-leaning solution, which is always just tough on crime, mandatory minimums, bail reform, you know, more police officers. Uh, am, I, am I getting to a point where, where I'm, I'm, I'm dumbing down where this debate needs to go? Is it about more than that, I'm assuming? Well, I, I actually do agree with you. I think there's really only two things that are on offer to deal with all these problems we're talking about and seeing in our communities. One is uh, essentially a status quo, kind of tinkering with it. Um, the system doesn't rehabilitate really anyone. Uh, the research shows that sending people to prison, they leave worse off. They're actually more likely to reoffend. And part of the reason for that, we heard in the the interviews we did for this book, Indictment, it was with people who'd spent, uh, in some cases, their entire, uh, I'd say adult lives, but it's actually not. They started getting incarcerated at 12 years old. Okay. So we have the status quo and kind of tinker with it. And it's, it's, it's not improving. Things get worse. All those metrics I mentioned are just getting worse and worse. The other side is, yeah, let's, you know, people are saying we should go back to do tough on crime. Remember those days, you know, um, you know, look, if, if more police and harsher prison sentences made us safer, look, the United States would be the safest country in the world, right? It's not. And so I think we need a different approach. That's what I, I set out in this book. We really do put the system on trial. Uh, but the second part is all about, you know, how could we do things differently? And I argue that we should follow the evidence. Look at what works. And there are programs that are reducing re- recidivism, that are giving real healing for survivors, and are at a fraction of the price. And that's what I think we need to be talking about and bringing that into the conversation to our a very kind of, quite frankly, tired and polarized criminal justice debate. Yeah. And, and I, I, mean, I just think that people want to have informed debate. Um, which which I'm grateful that you're bringing facts to the table. We'll take a look at some case studies that have worked. But let me ask you first, if you're putting the criminal justice system on trial, what charges is it facing? Boy, oh boy. Um, you know, when we look at what the system has done and the harm it has done to survivors of crime, what it's done to people who are incarcerated and are supposed to be, uh, you know, separated from society for a time to reenter after they've paid their debt, the, the charges are myriad. Um, let's start with the most serious ones. Indigenous people who have looked at how the system treats uh, Indigenous people as as survivors and victims of crime, um, quite frankly, like nobodies. Uh, that's a conclusion from an inquiry here in BC. Uh, complaints that when they reported their missing loved ones, they were ignored. Um, you know, I remember during the time, you know, even 10 years ago, here in in bc there were posters the police would put out of like missing pets like if you found this missing pet at the same time in you know provinces like manitoba there are complaints that missing teenage indigenous girls were not being uh, talked about by the police publicly so Mm -hmm. there is a huge problem in our country with a with really very massively disproportionate outcomes for indigenous people when it comes to to that so it's been called a genocide right it's been called a genocide of indigenous uh women and girls And the incarceration of Indigenous people and people with substance use disorders, people with mental health issues, people who are poor, that's who fills our prisons. So the charges include things like uh, abuse of force by police Mm -hmm. and corrections officers. We have cases like that in Alberta right now that I'm sure you're familiar with, where they have been, uh, you know, recommended that police be charged with uh, with abuse of force. And yet those those charges don't go ahead. We also have the most uh, serious charges of deaths. Uh, we know that people who are incarcerated are, are 50 times more likely to die of unregulated drugs. They're also disproportionately victims of suicide. And um, and for the rest of us, I think the indictment is that we are not being kept safe. Uh, we see the outcomes in our communities and more of the same uh, reactive policing after the fact. And then this kind of in and out, in and out, in and out through the criminal justice system. It's not making anyone safe and it's doing a real disservice to to, to the folks who are survivors of crime, people who are incarcerated, and all of us. It seems to me, and I'm not piling on here, I'm, I'm calling it how I see it, that the public trust in police 
has uh, declined in a big way. Uh, and I only have anecdotal evidence for that. I, I don't have polling in front of me, but I, I just know what I know. And I see the reaction, the public reaction when police will clear, you know, homeless encampments as an example. You hear a lot about yeah. police brutality. There's more video now than ever body cam footage, uh, mostly out of the United States, but we see it in Canada as well and, and around the world. Is that relevant in the context of here and what we're talking about, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think part of the problem is that um, whether it's policing or the correction system, it's ever expanding, right? It's it's trying to take on more and more space. And so, you know, the solutions to homelessness, the research is pretty clear. It's providing people with homes and supportive housing, which, by the way, is way, way cheaper than sending someone to jail. And so what happens when you have these um, folks who are homeless and they're decamped, which means, you know, like here in Vancouver, literally their tents and their cardboard shelters are put into garbage trucks. Those people don't disappear uh, from 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 sight only. They end up in the back alleys and where they're at much higher risk of becoming victimized by uh, by criminals. Actually, we find that people who are unhoused are substantially more likely to be assaulted, for example, and they're more likely to overdose and die. Are concerns we hear from people because they're you know displaced. They're they're in an environment they are not familiar with, and you know clearly. You know, we no one thinks that people should be living in tents in Canada or, or trailers, especially with winter coming. Mm -hmm. But the answer is not police and bylaw to just displace them and get it out of our sight so we don't have to look at it. So rather than wasting, quite frankly, wasting money on those enforcement actions, we need to be providing things like supportive housing. So a lot of what we found in our research is the criminal justice system is involving itself in areas it shouldn't because other systems have failed. Mental health is another area. So to talk about that for a second, you know, uh, in policing, two thirds of people who die in police encounters were experiencing mental health distress or had substance use issues at the time. That's yeah. an extraordinarily high number. We're talking hundreds of people. And that's over a 20 year period. And to your point to about data, that is increasing. It is not just a perception. The statistics are that is increasing. So rather than have police respond, what other jurisdictions are doing, including in some parts of Canada, like in Toronto, in Eugene, Oregon, uh, they have 24 7 non-police mobile crisis response teams in some cities these are trained crisis workers and counselors so that you have an option rather than police fire an ambulance if someone's in mental health distress and, and i mean ryan this isn't just about like someone you know outside of your your house at two in the morning you know swearing and yelling all alone and like th this is about people who call for help with a elderly parent who has dementia or a mental health disorder and they call 911 because they can't deal with it anymore they are not asking for police but by and large police show up because they there's no other option police fire name it's not a fire you know they hear someone yelling they can't send a paramedic so we better send someone who has a gun and a taser and people die there is a public inquiry in ontario of exactly that it's a grant a grandfather who was killed by the toronto police service allegedly in a encounter when the call was for the family for support mm -hmm. this was an elderly man and he was killed and he was in his own home and there is a public inquiry now into his death here in vancouver uh miles gray is a young man who was also killed uh, by vancouver police it was found to be a homicide by a coroner's inquest um, these are the types of cases. Other ones I can mention, people with autism or developmental disabilities mistaken for having a mental health issue or being drunk, and the police end up using excessive force on them. Why? Because they're not responding in a typical way. The police say, hey, stop for a second. One case, the young man had noise-canceling headphones on, young man with autism. Police lay their hands on him. He doesn't know what's going on, so he resists a little bit. They are then told in their use of force protocol, you're allowed to use hard force. The the pictures of this young man, Ryan, are disgusting. His, his eyes are are, are literally swollen shut. This is a young man walking on the train tracks who has autism and the police were completely cleared of any kind of wrongdoing. Why? Because they were just following their training. So the system, quite frankly, is not designed to deal with the people who it's primarily encountering. And we need to take new and different approaches to make all of us safer and stop these sort of horrific incidents from happening. Yeah, we've 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 also got a a story, uh, and I'm sure you've been hearing about it in Edmonton as well about Pacey Dumas, yes, uh, who, who's lost his bid to have uh, a, a you know a police officer basically held accountable 
uh, for kicking him, for booting him in the head <clears throat> and uh, altering the course of his life moving forward with a horrific brain injury. You know what I also, also worry about? And this might not be where some people expect me to go next on this, but I also worry that young people and skilled professionals and people with empathy and understanding and all the tools that you need in law enforcement, and I, and I don't want to go too far down this one rabbit hole, but I worry that people aren't going to want to go into emergency response anymore. Who would want to be a police officer no. right now? No, I agree with you. And in fact, we see a, a, a recruiting problem. So as more and more uh, jurisdictions, including in Alberta, are promising more and more law enforcement officers, uh, corrections as well, um, we see, you know, we already have a job shortage, there's a big demographic shift. And these types of professions, which really are um, are supposed to be serving the public, are, are increasingly being seen, I think, quite correctly as, as having some fairly serious problems with them that they're often unwilling to address. So, you know, here in, in Vancouver, our uh, police chief denies that there's systemic racism in policing. Like he just outright says it's not happening, even when we have cases where police officers have arrested Indigenous people for trying to open bank accounts using their official status card. There's a case here where there was a human rights complaint after VPD arrested an Indigenous grandfather and his teenage daughter just trying to open a bank account. You know, the bank didn't recognize the status card. They called police. The police put them in handcuffs. And the worst part of it is part of the settlement was they were supposed to come to community in for an apology ceremony. That that Indigenous man was willing to forgive them, right? And the community was. But those two officers never even bothered to show up. And their seats were left empty with their names on them. And at the same time, the police chief who did show up denied that there was any broader problem. It's just a few bad apples. I have to tell you, that's what I thought too. I heard these cases time and again over the years. I thought... That's just a few bad apples. That's that one officer. What I realized through this research for my book, Indictment, after case after case of real people we talk to and looking at the broader research, is these are widespread issues. This does not mean that every every person who's a police officer, corrections officer, is a bad person or not. That's not the point. But when we interviewed corrections officers and police officers, they're telling us that they don't think the system is working either. They are not equipped and trained properly. So here's another example in, in our prisons. The qualification to be a federal corrections officer to apply is you only have to have a high school diploma and like a CPR course. Okay, that's it. In other, And then we're going to give you a bit of online training, some in-person training, mainly on use of force, and then send you into one of the most traumatizing environments um, that, uh, that you could be put into. In other countries like, like Norway, which takes a much more human approach, you have to have a post-secondary degree, you take a, about a two-year program where you're not just learning about use of force. Yeah, you learn that, but you're learning about how does confinement affect people psychologically, right? How do you support people with mental health issues and substance use issues? And we see completely different outcomes in countries like Norway. They had a system really similar to Canada's actually and very punitive, but they had a couple of prison riots and guards were killed. And they completely rethought things. They said, we're going to reorient the system around one question. And I think it's a great question we should ask is what kind of a neighbor do you want to have? Hmm. We hear all these cases of these random attacks, these chronic repeat offenders cycling through the system. The question I think we need to ask is that question too. What kind of a neighbor do we want to have? Virtually uh, everyone in custody is getting out eventually. They will get out in our yeah. communities. And they can either come out having had... Uh, drug treatment access in prison, mental health support, vocational training, right? Having some better contact with family, a much more safe and normalized environment that doesn't look like the Shawshank Redemption prison, like yeah. some prisons in Canada do. And they can get that support and then get out in the community and have a productive life. Or we can go our route. Now, the the stats speak for themselves. And this is a real question for Canadians. And what do we want to do? In Norway, under an old punitive model like we had, their, their recidivism, their reoffender rate was 60 to 70% of people were coming back in after, again, committing more crimes. They went down to just 20% after following a much more humane and innovative approach. So I think that's really the choice we have. Are we more interested in punishment and harsh conditions that keep these cycles of trauma and harm and abuse just going and going and going? Or are we willing to try something different? Maybe even it's just with one prison in jail in each province. Just let's see what happens. Let's follow a more humane approach and see what happens because we know our current system is actually just making things worse. Uh, ben, you know, we, we hear these horrific stories of, of somebody, uh, you know, assaulted or, or, you know, worst case scenario, killed on public transit or there was a brutal uh, beating death, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in Edmonton's Chinatown district. 
uh, last summer, I think it was. And, and, mm-hmm. and we, you know, this this individual that was supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, wasn't supposed to be where he was. He certainly wasn't supposed to be in Edmonton, had had basically been released uh, by RCMP, obviously a huge amount of controversy. The, the the bereaved family of this man who was beaten to death outside his shop, uh, mm. you know, appalled. And you know, situations like these, tragedies like these, have Canadians talking a lot about bail reform. And it's been uh, certainly uh, one of the leading talking points of, of Pierre Polyev, his promise to Canadians as, as leader of Canada's Conservatives. We back on September 23rd had an interesting conversation here on the show talking about crime and punishment. And we brought together from the opposite sides of the courtroom, uh, we brought together the presidents of the associations representing the crown prosecutors and the criminal trial lawyers. So we had the, the president of the Defense Lawyers Association and the president of the Crown Prosecutors Association. That was Dallas Sopko and Paul Morrow. And Paul Morrow, so what we're about to play a clip here for you. I'm curious for your take on it. I asked him about bail reform. This is the guy, this is the president of the association representing the defense lawyers, but he was previously the president of the Association for Crown Prosecutors. So he's done both, and here's what he had to say about bail reform. The failure is not a failure of the law, and it's not a failure of the court system. It's a failure of resourcing the support and supervision of people who are released on bail. So we come back again and again to the idea of adequate resourcing, and here we've got the Alberta provincial government putting forward this major announcement about a major change in the way criminal justice is being conducted in Alberta without having even spoken to the Crown attorneys who are supposed to carry that out. By the way, uh, the, they haven't spoken to my group either about this topic. Uh, this came as, as much of a surprise to us as it did to Dallas and the Crown attorneys. Uh, so really, if the government is going to be serious about doing something here, they need to look at resourcing in uh, a way that addresses the root causes of offending. And that means resources for mental health treatment and for addictions treatment. Obviously touches on some of the points that you made. Uh, Generally speaking, is he on the right track? Yeah, I think so. I agree with quite a few things you said. Um, and it's it's important like to realize how these criminal justice policy changes get made, right? You could hear that. There was no consultation. The people who are, who are part of the system are not even spoken to. And so it just shows again and again, we are doing criminal justice policy in Canada on the fly. It's reactive, right? There's some new horrific case that happens in our community. And they, there are unfortunately are many throughout the country, again, because the system is so fatally flawed. And we then react right away. And we pass some new law or some new policy without pausing to go, is this even working? Um, I'm actually giving a talk later today at, at lunchtime, a webinar with the Fraser Institute. And the topic is, are we getting good value for our public safety money, right? This is a public service. And no one, no one really looks at that. What should the outcomes be? I think a key outcome should be uh, decreasing the level of crime and harm in our society. That includes things like reducing reoffending and recidivism. And to get back to the clip you just showed, we absolutely have to address the underlying and root causes of uh, what causes people to become involved in, in, in criminal activity. And we know very well what those are. I mean, the criminology research is very clear. And our prisons are full of people who are not getting that help and end up cycling in and out. So this is why bail reform is 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 not even a Band-Aid solution. Uh, when people are denied bail, two things happen. Number one, they are in an incredibly traumatic environment. And I'm going to talk in a minute about some people have to be denied bail. OK, I'm not saying that. OK, we've talked about conditions could be better. But two things happen. One is they're put in an incredibly traumatic environment. If they're not connected with organized crime or street gangs, they get connected pretty quick, if anything, just to survive the experience and stay safe inside. So when they come out, they're worse off than when they entered. The second thing that happens is they are cut off from typically if they had a home, they very often could lose it. They're going to lose their job. They're going to possibly come up with a criminal record, especially if they plead out or found guilty. They're going to lose access to their mental health and substance use support if they had any to begin with. So we talk to folks who are incarcerated, they speak of being released in the community with no ID, in prison shoes, with nowhere to go, and it's it's like late in the day. And yeah, no wonder people end up breaking into cars and stealing things. We're literally setting our communities up for a public safety nightmare when we do that. It's not serving anyone who turn around and blame these, these criminals. They're to blame, Pierre Paul said. They're the criminals to blame. We're not to blame, they're to blame. I I don't know about you, Brian, but when I when something goes wrong, I learned this later in life. If there's part of it that's my responsibility, I want to take responsibility, you know, 
Like if I have a disagreement with my with my wife, and I think you know mainly mainly it's her thing, you know this is mainly her thing. But there's part of it, you know, I did, you know, I've learned. It took me a while, you know, a little bit of hair, a little gray. I own up to my part. I think we as a society need to own up to our part in this, and we have a role to play as well. And so, yeah, the third thing I'd mention about um about denying people bail is you end up with a really perverse incentive, uh, which doesn't serve anyone. When you're in pretrial custody, you're typically given extra credit for that time because I, there is no programs. Uh, it, the conditions are harsh. And so the courts, I think, quite rightly uh, recognize that. So what ends up happening is you're in there on the clock. Let's say you are guilty and you're going to be maybe get a, a two month sentence or something like that. When you're one month in to being denied uh, bail, you've already fully served your sentence, even if you were found guilty. So the crown has to be monitoring this stuff, you know, and if they if they're not, you end up languishing in there. But typically, they'll you know look at that and go, okay, well, you've already served your effective sentence, so if you plead guilty, you can come out. So if you are guilty, you're getting out right away again, no treatment, no support, but worse off, right? We know that short prison sentences like that, in particular, increase reoffending. And secondly, if you are innocent, and remember, not everyone who is charged is guilty. Uh, in fact, you know, fifty percent of charges in some jurisdictions get stayed or withdrawn, right? You're not you're not guilty. But if you are not able to afford a lawyer, and this is the case of many of the folks we see incarcerated, you're going to plead guilty. Why? Because you can either protest your innocence and stay in there and wait for a trial to happen, which may not happen for up to a year and a half or so, or, you know, on principle for something that you might only get like two months prison for anyway. Um, or you just plead out now. You get the record, you have conditions you maybe can't keep. Like you have a substance use disorder. Now you're promising not to have a drop of alcohol. Good luck. So we're just setting people up for failure. I think you'll take this as a compliment. Glenna in our live chat says, Mr. Perrin has evolved from his Harper days. Uh, you, you've been on the show before talking about your evolution of thought or your evolution of conviction on, on things like safe supply or drug policy, harm reduction. Um, w would you describe as drastic or have you experienced as drastic of, a, of an evolution, so to speak, with your perspective on criminal justice over the past 15 years, 10 years? Yeah, I'd say these changes for me really only started about five years ago. And that's um, right when I started doing my research into the, the unregulated drug crisis. It, it also is the origins of this project, too, mm. which I, I you know, I, we didn't talk about how it started. It actually started with a letter I received, a handwritten letter in the mail. You know, as a criminal law professor, people really reach out hoping desperately for some kind of help, even though I'm, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not practicing. I'm, you know, full time teaching and research right now. And uh, usually I'll refer them to, you know, legal aid or some uh, advocacy group that might be able to help them, hopefully. This person was different. This was an Indigenous man serving a sentence at a provincial correctional facility here in BC. He had an a eight-page handwritten letter. He didn't ask for anything. It would have been much easier, Ryan, if he did, because I would have been like, oh, isn't that so horrible that this has happened to you? Here's someone who can help you. And I could move on with my day. Because he didn't ask for anything, I just put, put the letter to the side of my desk. I keep coming back to the office and I'm like, oh, the, the letter's there again. I read it again. And it was incredibly disturbing. I mean, he just wanted to share his story. He wanted someone to hear what was going on behind bars. And there was a line in his letter, which was very, like, it was outright haunting. He said, if you want to turn a man into an animal, put him in a cage without the resources to build himself back up. Whew. And I've looked at the photos of the prison that he served time in. This, I was actually online this morning. Uh, preparing for a talk I'm going to give later this week. And I was looking for photos of that particular prison. I found the photo. It is, a, these are cages. These are cages we're locking people in. And um, that was the start of this project. And, you know, we, we haven't talked a lot about survivors of crime in this, in this conversation, but that's the whole other half of what I researched. You know, my earlier career was all about advocacy and support for survivors of crime. And I continue to do that. And in the context of this conversation, um, you know, what we heard again and again from the survivors of crime we spoke with was that they are not getting what they need from the system. They're being treated like pieces of evidence. Crimes are wrongs against the state, they're told, not against the people who are who are the actual victims of them. And so they end up getting treated that way, whether it's by the police or prosecutors, um, by victim services sometimes, and you know, fairly horrific examples. And what the research tells us and what, what I heard from people individually in these interviews, when they're victimized by crime, the, the main things they want is they want to know what's happening. They just want information like what's going on. Did you find the perpetrator? Has he been charged? When's the trial? Like what's going on? Too often they're completely left in the dark, which, you know, in a situation where you've been been victimized is one of the worst things that can happen to you. 
The other thing they want is they want to participate. They want to be involved in some way in the process. And the third is they want some sort of meaningful outcome for them. And it's not the case that every victim of crime wants their uh, the person who harmed them to you know be locked up and rot in prison forever. And many of them spoke about the fact that what they really wanted was to have um, have some amends made, some apologies, some sort of collaborative or restorative justice process. And when we see those processes happen uh, in Ottawa, there's a program I profile called Collaborative Justice Initiative, and they involve survivors of crime and people who've been charged. And they found that there are much higher rates of satisfaction for for survivors through that process, where they are at the table. They are one of the two main people at the table, whereas now they're in the back of the, they're not even in the courtroom, actually, Ryan, for the trial. They can't even sit in there if they're a witness because they can be tainted. So they're typically not even in the room. In restorative justice, they're in the room. They're intimately part of that process. And uh, we also see lower rates of offending, right? So, you know, this is a, this is the kind of programs that we see working. But again, they're they're just not being picked up. They're being stifled for funding, stymied. And we continue to have this, you know, kind of Victorian England criminal justice model. Uh, we're talking to Ben Perrin, whose uh, new book, Indictment, is available anywhere you get your good books. You'll have more information in the show notes on uh, the podcast or on YouTube. You have a, a great piece, and I should mention your podcasting as well. I want to ask you about that in a second. But yeah. um, a piece in the Globe and Mail on uh, September 29th from Tough on Crime to a new transformative vision for Canada's justice system. And you get into a lot of the subject matter, uh, your research and, and what you write about in the book. But there's one part here in particular that I wanted to touch on. You say victims of crime, and we just talked about survivors of crime. You say they've largely given up on the system. You say only one third of incidents are reported to authorities. For sexual offenses, only one in 20 are reported. Less than 1% of sexual offenses result in any resolution within the system. And studies have found that victims are even less satisfied with the adversarial criminal justice system than people who committed the offenses. That's an indictment, uh, to say it the very least. Um, so you get to the point now where you ask, okay, so when, when you're calling for a transformative reinvention or a reimagining of, of uh, how Canada uh, navigates this, you, you've got to have the public on board. You've got to have a willing public. You've got to have the political will. You've got to be able to have cooperation between law enforcement and mental health services. You've got to have the financing. For, you, you get the point. I know the audience gets the point as well. Like, let me ask you this. Is it realistic that we get there? I mean, do you see this actually happening? It's I'm, I'm so proud of you for writing this book. And people like Sharon in our live chat are saying, I got to get my hands on this book. But do you ever see change actually happening? You know, I do. And I'll tell you where I see it happening. The The really cool thing about what we found in the book is when I got to the second part and it's like, well, how could we do things differently? I wasn't just sitting in my office thinking up neat ideas. You know, here's some theory. People know me better than that at this point. And no, I, my research is on the ground. I'm going to the communities. I'm talking to folks. For every one of the seven different kind of key pillars of a new uh, transformative justice vision, there are actual policies, programs that are in place and working in some cases in Canada, but other places around the world. So this isn't just a, a pipe dream, right? This is actually happening. But again, it's on small scale bases. The other thing that I think is encouraging for me and why I have hope is many of these initiatives, you don't have to wait for the government to come around. Because I agree with you, Ryan, the number one thing I'm hearing as we're doing this national uh, book tour across Canada, including coming to Alberta at the end of November, both to Calgary and Edmonton, uh, people are saying, no one's saying like, hey, that's a crazy idea. You know, I don't agree with that policy. Or have you looked at this research? It disagrees with that. No one's saying that. They're saying, this sounds like something we should try. But what about the politics? Right. So I'm keeping hearing that again and again. So part of the way that I uh, I have hope, number one is we see programs like the 24-7 non-police crisis response teams. Those started in, in a city in uh, Eugene, Oregon as an initiative of a nonprofit organization. This is a group that was serving, you know, homeless folks and said like, we keep seeing the police show up. This isn't working for the clients. Like we should do this. We should be the ones there. And sure enough, once they started just on their own doing it, police are looking at this going, hang on a second. There's someone over there in mental health distress. Like they, you know, in, in lay terms, they, they're, they're losing it over there. And the police are going, I don't want to be the next one on CNN with my body cam, having shot someone who came at me with a butter knife and it was dark and I, I I don't want to be that person. Why don't we get these guys in there? It's called cahoots, crisis assistance, helping out on the streets. Why don't we get these guys in there? Before long, you know what they did? They integrated them into the 911 service. Hmm. So in the city, they're now taking between 15 to 20% of all 911 and non-emergency police calls. That's a ton 
of diverted calls. And they're doing it again at a fraction of the price. So again, that's an example of a community seeing a need, organizing around it, fundraising around it. And eventually government takes a look at it and police go, this is a great project. We should do this. Uh, same thing when it comes to Indigenous justice. I talk about that in the book. Indigenous-led uh, peacekeeping or policing in communities that have that for their uh, for their nation, we see a 25% reduction in violent crime. And, and they do do research on public confidence in those communities and police. And of course, it won't surprise you to hear, Indigenous people say they feel safer and they're more satisfied with their own Indigenous-led policing in their communities, not white RCMP officers. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of one of the things I want to make sure our audience knows is is that you have such a unique and you don't see this all the time. This is a really neat and valuable resource along with your book. You, you've released a, a podcast series, nine episodes at least right now. Uh, people can go listen to them. Um, you tell these people stories, Myrna, and Nate and Jessica. People can hear it in their own words. People can hear from the people that you've leaned on, the people that you've spoken to, the people you've learned from. Uh, to put this book together uh, again, it's uh, indictment, the criminal justice system on trial. You can find it anywhere you get your podcast. Shout out, by the way, Ben, you're one of the very few podcasts. You have a perfect 5.0 rating on Apple Podcasts. You know that? Oh, uh, don't don't tell the people uh, that if people don't tell your haters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 5.0. No, look, hey, buddy. We just started. No, no, we just started, Ryan. But no, it's um, the biggest piece of feedback on the podcast. And you're absolutely right. What people will hear is what I heard. That's why we did the podcast. Um, the book, you know, some people read books, some people don't. If you've read the book, people love the podcast because you get to hear a lot more. But I want I want people to go on the journey that I went on. I want you to hear in your own words what people say in response to that very basic question you asked them. What was your experience like with the criminal justice system? And it, the kind of um, insights that you get from hearing from folks is just incredible. And some of the stories are heartbreaking, but there's a lot of hope in there. And uh, pretty much every episode, I also talk briefly at the end about, you know, how we could do things uh, better. So, yeah, people should definitely uh, check out the podcast. It's, uh, it's free. It's on Apple, uh, Spotify, online. It's it's same title as the book, Indictment, the Criminal Justice System on Trial. So, yeah. Very well done, my man. And obviously relevant uh, and such important subject matter. The book, again, Indictment uh, by our guest, Professor Benjamin Perrin. You can find him on Twitter. If you want to give him a shout out personally at Prof Ben Perrin. And uh, of course, uh, a real pleasure to talk to you every time you're on the show. We appreciate it. Hey, thank you, Ryan. It's a real, uh, real pleasure too. You Take got care. it, man. Yeah, that is a, a guy that operates in earnest, and I love it. Cahoots. That's a cool name. That's a cool acronym for a program. I like that. Cahoots. Yeah, I heard that. Uh, we got a lot of people with really excellent comments. I, I like this. Um, Glenna, by the way, has been bringing it this morning on the live chat, but she says, if other countries have shown a way to, towards success, do we reinvent the wheel or just try to make our programs more like theirs? You know, which is more efficient? I think that's a great question. We can certainly learn from other countries. Uh, somebody said in the chat, it seems like Norway does everything right. I'm like their sovereign wealth fund, right? right? It's yeah. a little bit different, but everybody in Alberta wishes that Alberta could be Norway. Um, again, or Switzerland. Uh, it's it's not apples and apples, but uh, yeah, <laughs> Switzerland too. Switzerland's doing a good job. Um, you can let us know what you think about that. And of course, th there's no story more powerful than a personal story. Uh, how is what we're talking about impacting you or landing with you as someone who has lived experience? You can send us a note. We're easy to find. Just check out the contact link on our website ryanjesperson.com every wednesday we head out to the mountains uh you know a breath of fresh air a reminder of what lies in wait it's my jasper memories presented by our friends at tourism jasper and we want to let you know starting this weekend coming up in just a couple of days kicks off the jasper dark sky festival this is an annual celebration of one of the world's most impressive dark sky reserves. This is a chance to see essentially the cosmos in a completely different light, surrounded by the Cathedral of the Rocky Mountains and so many cool events uh, for you to take in. So the first weekend, um, which is, is getting pretty w well sold out. I mean, that's not to say you can't still find your way in, but as you know, they've added weekends. So from the 13th, to the 29th, it's a great time to head out to Jasper. Uh, the second weekend from October 20th to 22nd, you know, approximately 10 days from now, 
Uh, it's got a ton of free events, which is great. Family-friendly activities. It's the perfect time to get out there, including that drone light spectacle. This is so cool. Uh, including an outdoor concert by Jay Ingram and the Dark Sky Band. This one-of-a-kind show should not be missed. You can witness an inspiring creation of drone choreography. How cool is that? Set to the original song, Cascade. Uh, there's a note for drone enthusiasts, by the way. A recreational drone use not allowed in national park boundaries. So this is a really neat opportunity. They're using permitted drones in a confined space to replace traditional fireworks. This is kind of where some shows are going. It's a really neat new way to use technology. There's also the Science for Brunch series. You can get a great meal and hear fascinating talks from experts in their fields, including AI experts like Matthew Guzdial and Patrick Pilarski, planetary scientist Eric Karkoschka. Uh, other family-friendly events, most of these are free. Uh, I want to let you know about BioBlitz, where you and your kids can do citizen science, stargazing, solar gazing with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. They've got laser-guided tours of the constellations. The lasers kind of help you see where they are and connect the dots in the stars. They've got geocaching, the dark sky treasure hunt. And then they have that wisest youth camp, which is a really neat opportunity. A hands-on workshop with chemistry demonstrations. There's a rocketry lab, John, a rocketry lab. I like that. grabs that. my attention. The blast-off demonstrations and then Science Fest presented by the TELUS World of Science Edmonton. You can learn more about the Jasper Dark Sky Festival running October 13th through the 29th in Jasper by visiting jasperdarksky.travel. I like that laser constellation display. That's mm -hmm. a really neat way to do it. That's I do like how cool they're stuff. opting out of the fireworks there as well because especially you'd think in a park like that's no bueno for like wildlife and stuff, right? Well, and the elk, elk rut's happening right now too and I'm not yeah. sure you want startled bulls running around. <laughs> I was uh, I was out there a couple weekends ago, and I don't know if you saw it. I posted on people can find it on my Twitter, on my Instagram, mm. um, a video, and and I, I know that some people will, will suggest that I might have been a little too close to this bull elk, but it's kind of deceiving because I was up on a raised platform behind a fence, mm. so I was kind of separated from this bull, but he was right outside our room at the Fairmont Jasper Park Lodge, and the power, like if you ever heard an elk bugling mm -hmm. uh it is like this guttural sound it sounds like a humpback whale mm -hmm. but it's like 30 it's high pitch you know it's You'd like think maybe it would be 30 meters away yeah, yeah. it's just wild so cool man uh you know obviously i work with the elks and and their first season you're talking when, about the football team yeah yeah the edmonton elks when they changed the name they had they i tried to employ some of those calls as like battle cries really? like during the game and it was just it it's literally scared kids and stuff because it is it, it <laughs> sounds like shamu it sounds like a high-pitched squeal. It's not at all what you'd think the noise that would come out of an elk. Yeah. But no, I am obviously not going to, uh, you know, be mad at you for trying to get close to what you, well, remember, no, but you it, remember my bison encounter but it is a real thing yeah your bison encounter is wild yeah. but but people will like you see folks out there and, and like oftentimes it's tourists who maybe just don't know any better there's signage everywhere trying to tell people especially this time of year because yeah. this is where stay away the elk are like you know looking to plant their seed if you know <laughs> what i mean and uh you don't want to get in the in between them and, and the cows but uh, you know, people get super close with photos, and it's like that elk can be on you in a split second with mm -hmm. horrific consequences. I mean, you can mm -hmm. be killed, right? So you, you always want to remind people they say 100 feet away from an elk. That's what they say. I would, 30 meters. Yeah, I'd do more than you know, that. Now. Yeah, maybe more than After that. They're my buys. And they, like animals in general, like they're, they're totally nonchalant. They act like you're not even there until you're until right there, there, and then they just, and they know you're there. Yeah. Serious business uh, yesterday. If you if you missed our episode on October 10th, we encourage you to check it out. We talked to Kinneret Ozeri, uh, who joined us live from her home. She was just out of a bomb shelter and didn't know if she was going to be going back in. Uh, it's where she spent the weekend with her husband and their three young daughters. Uh, she lives outside Tel Aviv. Uh, she was talking to us about the toll that the violence is taking. Uh, her personal perspective, Charles Adler, uh, chimed in on that as well. Johnny, can you load up our YouTube short? Here's a, here's a brief summary of what we talked about yesterday. Thousands of people, including more than 250, executed at a music festival. The way that uh, Hamas has attacked children, elderly, raping, having no regard for human life. They're a terrorist organization and they're terrorist. 
terrorizing us. The idea that uh, Hamas represents the Palestinian people is ridiculous. If Hamas didn't think of the Palestinian people simply as props in their effort to fulminate as much Jew hatred as possible, they wouldn't be doing this because anyone who chops the heads off babies knows fully well that the families of those children, the communities, and the army that represents them is going to be doing horrible things to Palestinian men, women, and children. Pro-Palestine demonstrations over the weekend, including Canadian cities, St. Albert and Edmonton. You, you could take issue with the United States, but if your first instinct on 9-11 or 9-12 of 2001 would be to pick up Saudi flags and wave them at ground zero, uh, I just don't know what to tell you. You can watch that full episode or listen to it. That was October 10th on Real Talk. We invite your feedback. We want to know how what you're hearing here on the show is resonating with you. And so Hish uh, took the time to send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com, says, I listened to you and Adler clutch pearls uh, regarding the pro-Palestinian rallies across Canada. I was a little confused, Ryan, as Israel is an apartheid state, has killed as many civilians in the past three days, if not more, and has killed journalists and tens of thousands of civilians over the past few decades. Should you not be as outraged at pro-Israeli rallies that are ongoing. It doesn't seem like a country we should be celebrating or rallying behind. That from Hish. Uh, I'm not going to respond to every single email. I said what I had to say yesterday, and I stand by it, but I want to get to as many of these as I can. Tom says a lot is being said recently about the difference between war and terrorism. Uh, people like to claim that war is, is, is a justifiable, if regrettable, course of action, whereas terrorism is evil. And its perpetrators are despicable, malevolent actors who should be wiped off the face of the earth. This is a laughable distinction in these times when the difference between war and terrorism is nothing more than the viewpoint of the narrator telling you the story. Tom says the Geneva Convention, a set of rules for conducting war, has been abandoned by practically every country, certainly all the big ones. Uh, this was an attempt by soldiers to somehow make the practice of their trade more noble and justifiable. However... The dark side of human character has emerged from the shadows to allow rape, torture, and murder of innocents to be practiced with glee by everyone from world leaders to the lowest-ranked private. Hamas uses opposition from Israel as an excuse to rape and murder Israeli citizens. In return, Israel uses this as an excuse to carpet bomb civilians in Palestine. Americans blow up entire cafes to kill a single person of interest. Russians blow up cafes just to intimidate people. Rape has become standard military practice. Weddings, funerals, and music festivals are now juicy military targets. War is terrorism. It's not a solution. Solutions are born from communication, cooperation, and compromise. If you're looking for something different to war or terrorism, try embracing peace. Any time is a good time to start talking and listening instead of shooting and killing. That's from Tom. Kyle wrote in to say, I, I watched your show live on Tuesday, and I couldn't help uh, the horror that I saw in the live chat, but also coming from uh, Charles and Jana Pruden. Uh, Jana joined us to talk about her new podcast, In Her Defense, uh, the story of Helen Nasland, who endured 30 years of abuse before shooting her husband dead in his sleep. Uh, Kyle says, we can all agree that what Hamas did to Israel is bad. I hope. Uh, to me, Hamas signed its own death warrant, plus Gaza's death warrant. You know, believing that Donald Trump had anything to do with this or gave information to Russia is disgusting and appalling from Adler. I want to clarify, Kyle, I asked Adler uh, for his opinion on a comment in the live chat. That's not something he brought up, but we'll take your point. Uh, he, uh, Kyle goes on to say, but what got me was that the same people who denounced Hamas uh, seemed to support the woman who murdered her husband saying that she had every right to, that it was self-defense, that she should have seen no jail time. She was sentenced, by the way, to 18 years, uh, that she's a hero. Kyle says it's disgusting and deplorable uh, to celebrate the murder of any defenseless human, and I do not see a world where you can say Hamas is wrong, but a woman murdering her abusive husband is morally right. He says, uh, I don't know. He goes, it, just in this society, in this world that we live in, says Kyle, we're seeing many false sexual assault allegations. He says it affects athletes, uh, celebrities, people alike. Look at Trevor Bauer, the story of Trevor Bauer, who is extorted for more than $50 million. I know men personally who have been falsely accused. Kyle says, I was. He says, we need to have more conversation and talk about how false accusations can ruin people's lives. People kicked out of universities, people uh, guilty before proven innocent. Uh, Kyle says, truly, it's sad to see the state that the world is in. That's how our conversation yesterday resonated with him. 
And this is an interesting one from Angry Adam. Angry Adam says, you know, us humans, and, and Adam, as you can see here, I mean, Adam wrote us a lot, so I'm going to pare it down uh, two pages. Uh, he said, I felt compelled to briefly contribute. Uh, he says, one day I'll master the art of a brief contribution, but not today. Us humans love to plant flags. He says it's kind of our thing. We pick a side, uh, we contemplate the odds, count the cards, and then hedge our bets. We also like to announce to the world or anyone that will listen whose side we think is right. As if whatever conflict of ideas that's being promulgated and the idea that, you know, we think is out thinking the others thinking, we somehow think that this thoughtless pondering has profoundly personified our personality. And as a thousand bookies start gyrating, as if we simultaneously flipped a quarter into a hundred vibrating motel beds, it's just what we do. He says, your interview with Jana Pruden on the story of Helen Nasland struck a chord with me. He says a topic just as equally unsettling as that previously discussed, Israel and Hamas. He says, as a mortal technique said, flow through the blood of Abraham like the Jews and the Arabs, broken apart like a woman's heart abused in a marriage. I share a great deal of admiration, says Adam, for those who share the difficult stories and the ones whose story the difficult shares. He says these are the stories that demand attention, the stories that share the human condition, the stories that bend and bow and flex us. Stories then that require us to let go and let be. He says, what's going on right now between Hamas and Israel makes my heart hurt. And no, I'm not justifying what they're doing. I'm not planting a flag like the prescription says. He says, I'm not a pawn in this game. These are people, people trying to live their lives and they're being cut down. And I feel the same way, hurt every time a Palestinian is cut down or has their house bulldozed while they're just bulldozed while they're just trying to live. He says, but it's the word I use, hurt, when something in the balance of life alters me negatively. Now, I wish Hamas did not make the decision to attack Israel. I, fl- I feel it plays into the hands of their oppressors, oppressors who design policies that force humans to act in this manner. He says, I wish I could say it's just this current far right wing Israeli government under Netanyahu that's been dousing the flames. But I feel like the track record over time has not been strong. See, the mistake we make, says Adam in closing, when we plant flags, is that we plant flags around policies. We always say, I stand with Israel or I stand with Palestine, but we don't understand what it means. Politicians do, he says, because they have interests. Not that we don't, but let's not go there. Let's get back on track. Most people want to sympathize with the people, but we're being tricked. He says, when I see the footage, I see myself at that music festival. I see my cousin being taken from her home and abused. So I stand with those people because that's all someone we could know. He says, I'm going to do the most counterintuitive thing imaginable, and I will plant a flag, but I'm planting it my way. I'm planting it with the people who have to deal with the obstacles to life arbitrarily placed in front of them and by those who don't give two rips about them on every side. I plant my flag with the people and policy can go fuck itself let's end the cycle that from angry adam i appreciate that thought you know it's never lost on us when people take mm-hmm. the time uh especially adam who writes with such a unique style and and, and people that that put I like their, that email put themselves out there and and, and, and take the t- it's not lost on us it's why we try to fit as many as we can and we can't read mm-hmm. all the emails from yesterday but i want to let you know that we commit on this show to continue to have these conversations conversations on issues that matter to you that resonate to us you know that truly are issues that demand and deserve our attention. It clearly matters in the chat today. I know yesterday was just a hard show for everyone. We were talking about it, it after. Like, you know, I had to go do some research, try and pull some things for clips and maybe to talk today. And just because we're so connected now digitally, I mean, the stuff that you see right on Twitter, right on X or wherever, I, it was hard for me to deal with. And uh, it's just... You know, when you're younger, you think of like wars, like two guys on either side behind enemy lines shooting from far away. This is in your face. This is horrible stuff happening over there on both sides, like rape, depravity, lack of humanity and in one of the holiest places on Earth. So, yeah, and uh, I, I don't think there is a right side at this point. It's been going on so long and there's been so much harm on both sides. I mean. And yet, I will, I will everyone's say, hesitant these days to even say those two words back yeah. to back, to say both sides. 
right? Because of what Donald Trump did. And, uh, and, and what are the sides? You've got you know, Hamas and there's Hezbollah. There's good people got... on both sides, <laughs> you know. And then people says, well, you're people will say to a show like this, oh, you're going to both sides mm-hmm. an issue, yeah, right? You're going to talk to someone in Palestine and you're going to talk to someone in Israel. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's simple. And by the way, I was proud of you because you're the one that prompted. I, I hope you don't mind me saying it to our audience. <laughs> we feel like they're family. You prompted our mental health break yesterday, and you and I had a really good talk. Yeah, uh, I compared it to firefighters gathering around the table at the fire hall after a tough call. Yeah, you and I had some time. I had to stop and, and I stop looking that at it because this is humanity. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I wanted to let everybody know that, by the way, there was in in the face of tragedy. There was something remarkable that went down yesterday after my friend Kinneret, you know her, that, that joined us on the show. She was a friend of mine from high school, um, and she, uh, she, she did this interview with us. You could hear the, 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 the pain in her voice. Mm-hmm. Um, she didn't want to tell us something uh, while she was talking to us uh, because she didn't want to put anybody in danger. Uh, but, Johnny, check this out. I'm showing this on my screen. After she talked to us, you know where she went? She and her family went to a ah, wedding. Ah, yeah. She and her family went to a wedding. She said it's not uh, part of our value system nor our beliefs. They don't call things off. She said we will not postpone Mm -hmm. nor cancel a wedding. So we gathered. She says as rockets flew overhead, she said we couldn't stop talking about the rockets. Mm -hmm. But they gathered there in community, uh, including the Ozeri family that was there yesterday. So if you missed that interview, it was uh, powerful stuff. It was crazy. Yesterday, the whole thing. And and just a few comments from those emails. I mean, you know, being... Palestine doesn't equal Hamas, but being against a bunch of people dying, innocent women, children, elderly, men, whoever, does not mean you're against an entire people. If it, Just because we said those, those demonstrations yesterday were in poor taste as this stuff was going on, doesn't mean that if, uh, you know, the Israeli army, you know, murdered a bunch of people and there were you know israeli demonstrations as well here we i didn't see those when when those things were going on if we had we'd i would, I think I would speak out lot, against them i too. think that it's a lot more you know, it's just, what it was was like citizen and and, and and maybe we're oversimplifying it but but in canada and the prime minister commented on this we shared it yesterday on the show the prime minister commented on the citizen demonstrations of people waving palestinian flags and adler talked yesterday about how Hamas does not represent the Palestinian Mm -hmm. people, but it felt like people dancing on graves. And so you had President Joe Biden, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, world leaders, the Chancellor of Germany, the President of France, like all all of them uh, standing in solidarity with Israel. You also have to keep in mind that politicians are worried about stability in the region, and Israel is a major player there and a major ally. So there's more to it, obviously, than may initially meet the eye. For most of you, that may be obvious or go without saying. But there were the stands of solidarity for Israel and then the citizen demonstrations of shows of support for Palestine. And for me... And it's okay if we disagree on this, but you will not change my mind. This is me speaking directly to those of you, including friends of mine that are texting me and sending me DMs yesterday saying, walk it back, Jesper, walk it back. Not a chance. It was dancing on graves. Terror attacks were continuing in Israel, and you were waving flags flown by the terrorists perpetrating the attacks. And there's no way to justify it. And I'll approach most things with an open mind, but not this one. And if you unsubscribe, like some of you told us you're going to do, or we've lost a listener forever, then so be it. But there are certain things we'll take principled stands on, and that's one of them. I wanted to also get to another story that we're keeping an eye on. But first, and here's something super positive. Let me tell you about what they've got going on at Athabasca University right now. We talk a lot about how AU is different than all other post-secondaries in Canada, right? You learn online. The only commute is to your device. You can learn at your own pace. You're never going to fall behind. You can work ahead if you like. Well, they've got a great series called Transforming Lives featuring the learners of Athabasca University. Uh, you can go check out their website or just Google Transforming Lives AU and you'll find it. Like the story of Hannah, who says, I'm better off financially because I can work extra hours without sacrificing my school day. And then I use that extra money to invest in my future. Or the story of Westcott, who says, you know, our family can't afford daycare, so I stay at home with the kids and study while my wife works. AU, Athabasca University, is the only reason that this is possible. I love this one from Christopher, who says AU was the catalyst for him continuing his academic pursuits. Or what about this one from Dakota, who talks about how everyone has a different learning style, but the benefit of AU's online courses was having the freedom to work, relocate, and pursue passions in life 
like traveling. That's why AU is a perfect fit for Dakota. Find your perfect fit by visiting Athabasca University online. You can get started today learning what the admissions process looks like, more about financial supports from the university that's trusted by tens of thousands of Canadians. We also wanted to give a big shout out to our friends at Friesen Brothers. Johnny, they got a lot going on right now. They just had those Thanksgiving dinner boxes that I know mm. that everybody was loving. Well, it's already full speed into October Feast. Yeah, that's right, October Feast. It's a German inspired all you can eat meal. You can learn more at Friesen.com or get the details in store. This is October 21st and 22nd, a German inspired all you can eat meal. That's Alberta beef roulade and chicken. Fricassie, German potato dumpling, sauerkraut, German rice, sourdough buns, the full salad bore, and more. Just $25 per person from 4 to 8 p.m. October 21st and 22nd at all Friesen Brothers Fresh Market stores. All right, I should also mention Complete Care Restoration. Let me give these guys a shout out. You know, I was hearing from somebody yesterday. I was at that Bomex conference I was telling you about, the commercial real estate. They're talking about how COVID... And a lot of other factors have really changed the dynamic downtown, where people are working from, more people working at home and the like. And it means that a lot of people, including property owners, uh, are kind of reimagining what they're doing with their facilities and their locations. Now, Complete Care Restoration is known for fire damage, flood damage, getting people back on their feet after that disaster strikes. But they've also got a talented team of construction and renovation professionals. They're full-service trade staff. If you're looking at maybe converting office space to condos or maybe vice versa, whatever it is, their staff can perform all necessary repairs and renovations to homes and businesses, ensuring that top quality condition remains everybody's number one goal. You can find them online at completecarerestoration.ca. We talked about it last week, and we couldn't uh, reveal too much about how we had the information, but we felt confident that Ontario's premier could soon find himself in a whole lot of hot water. Mm -hmm. And that is the case uh, yesterday. As we told you last week, uh, the CBC announcing that the RCMP has confirmed that they've launched an investigation into the Ontario government's plan to open the green belt for development. You don't say. It wow. sounds a little That's, shady. Wow. And it turns out that this could be something. The Ford government says it'll fully cooperate. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I love when people are like, we're going to fully, you're the premier we're of gonna Ontario. Fully we're going to fully cooperate. Yeah, well, whether you have a choice or not. We're going to give every investigator their own home. So you in the green belt, <laughs> just like we promised our black acre, friends. Yeah. So this is obviously a huge was to be a huge multi billion dollar development. The Ford mm -hmm. government did favors for its friends, um, and now it looks like there could be could be charges laid. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder how many people might be surprised to say, hypothetically speaking. Uh, Doug Ford or people close to him charged with racketeering or whatever the case may be. <laughs> I don't this think is anyone's... a big story out of Ontario. No one's surprised. Yeah, I don't you don't think, think anyone's surprised? No. I, th I think there was a whole community carved out for him and his buddies. Yeah. Yeah. Nice finished basements. And <laughs> I was talking to a political strategist yesterday. Won't say who, because uh, they're working in government right now. And she said to me, she goes, "Yeah, but this is kind of the way that this is what Doug Ford's known for." Like, Doug Ford's never used his government phone. He uses his personal phone. It reeks like mm. the Hillary emails story. It's the same thing. He does all his business and has all his meetings at his house. Mm -hmm. You want to do business with the Ontario government the, the premier's office? You come to the house. You smoke hash Smoking in the garage. Darts. Allegedly. <laughs> ripping darts with Dougie Ford. So we'll see what happens here, but this could be a big deal. Another yeah. story we're keeping an eye on is rumblings of a potential leadership change with Alberta's NDP. Uh, and I think people have seen that one coming for a while. The question is, what does that timeline look like? We like to reward those of you that stick around till the end of the episode with a few little tidbits of stories that we're following. Mm -hmm. But as rumor has it, it could be as early as December. It could be into next spring. But uh, I think that everybody assumed, and when we talked to Rachel Notley about this a while ago, we mm -hmm. asked her as much, you know, do you plan on sticking around for the next election? And it sounds like that party, Alberta's official opposition, could be uh, looking at a change in leadership over the next few months. So and I'm sure you have a guess around. on who it could be. So tell us. I do have my guess. Yeah. Uh, do I want to put it out there right now? Save it. Uh, Racky Pancholi. Racky Pancholi is going to be the next leader of the Alberta NDP. But there will be a fulsome leadership race, and we'll see who else enters it. And uh, we'll see how that alters the dynamic of Alberta politics. Uh, before we go, I wanted to read one more email. This is from Corbin. 
What a conversation last week with Andre Busanius and Evan Ossington. Evan's the editor of Alberta Views magazine. Andre is a recovering gambler. And she talked to us uh, about her personal experience. Uh, she says, I'm not necessarily against gambling. It's, it's basically just for me, it doesn't work. And Evan was talking to us about the Alberta Views cover story for the October issue, uh, which is about Alberta's addiction to gambling. Alberta essentially, in one sentence, spends the least per student on education and is the only province to allow charitable casino events. So if your kid's classroom or band or soccer team or art class is underfunded, just work a casino and you could make fifty or or $100,000. And a lot of you wrote in to say, and I appreciate this, they said you'd be screwed. You said we'd be screwed without these casino nights. They're huge. Some of you wanted to know why we're cracking down on casino nights. We're not. We're just saying it's a little weird, don't you think? So we got this email from Corbin, and I wanted to wrap the show with this. He says, you know, I heard Andre Bassanius on Real Talk last week, and I was really struck by the timing. Corbin says, our youngest child's school is having a casino night event in the near future, and our oldest child's school held one last year. We, my partner and I, did not volunteer uh, and will not volunteer in future. We've always thought it was an odd paradox, casinos and playgrounds. And Andre, uh, on Real Talk, helped solidify our feelings. Uh, we've recently participated in our children's school parent councils, and we'll be sharing some of what we heard on Real Talk and some of what we read in Alberta Views at the next council meeting. That's awesome, Corbin. Says we'd also like to propose to the council that our kids' schools, or even better, the division, hosts your group's workshops as an attempt to offset or balance the use of the casino charity. Says I know they're not going to turn away an opportunity to host an event, nor do I blame them. He's talking about Andre's work, the workshops that she does. Says clearly there's a problem with educational funding in Alberta, and that blame lies elsewhere. Corbin says, I think the council and fundraising committees should or could gain some empathy when considering why some people may not volunteer for this event. And what a great opportunity to educate students of the individual and societal impacts of gambling. That from Corbin. You can find that interview in our archives. That was just last week on the show. And of course, I want to let you know that Real Talkers get a special incentive to subscribe to Alberta Views magazine. You just go to albertaviews.ca and the promo code AVRJ, Alberta Views Ryan Jesperson, AVRJ promo code knocks 50% off a one-year subscription to Alberta Views. It means 10 issues delivered to your door for just 20 bucks. That's albertaviews.ca. Coming up on tomorrow's Real Talk, that's going to be Thursday, October 12th. We're sitting down with Alberta's finance minister. The Honorable Nate Horner is going to make the argument for an Alberta pension plan. I know a lot of you are against it. Some of you think it's a great idea. Here's the call to you. If you have a question you'd like us to consider putting in front of the finance minister, get it to us soon. Thanks for being a part of Real Talk. Thanks for smashing like, and we'll talk to you again soon. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, executive producer Josh Dunford.